Chapter Eight of the Story of Eclipses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Story of Eclipses by George Chambers. Chapter Eight: Eclipses of the Sun Mentioned in History. Chinese. This is the first of several chapters which will be devoted to historical eclipses. Of course, the total eclipse of the sun of August ninth, eighteen ninety six, observed in Norway and elsewhere, is, in a certain sense, an eclipse mentioned in history, but that is not what is intended by the title prefixed to these chapters. By the term historical eclipses, as used here, I mean eclipses which have been recorded by ancient historians and chroniclers who were not necessarily astronomers and who wrote before the invention of the telescope. The date of this may be conveniently taken as a dividing line, so that I deal chiefly with eclipses which occurred before, say, the year 1600. There is another reason why some such date as this is a suitable one from which to take a new departure, without at all avowing that superstition ceased on the earth in the year 1600, for there is far too large a residuum still available now, 300 years later, it may be said that the revival of letters did do a good deal to divest celestial phenomena of those alarming and panic-causing attributes which undoubtedly attached to them during the earlier ages of the world and during the dark ages in western europe quite as much as during any other period of the world's history no one can examine the writings of the ancient greek and roman historians and the chronicles kept in the monasteries of western europe by their monkish occupiers without being struck by the influence of terror which such events as eclipses of the sun and moon and such celestial visitors as comets and shooting stars exercised far and wide and this influence overspread not only the unlettered lower orders but many of those in far higher stations of life who one might have hoped would have been exempt from such feelings of mental distress as they often exhibited illustrations of this fact will be adduced in due course it has always been supposed that the earliest recorded eclipse of the sun is one thus mentioned in an ancient Chinese classic, the Chao King, sometimes spelt Xiao Qing. The actual words used may be translated, On the first day of the last month of autumn, the sun and moon did not meet harmoniously in Fang. To say the least of it, this is a moderately ambiguous announcement, and Chinese scholars, both astronomers and non-astronomers, have spent a good deal of time in examining the various eclipses which might be thought to be represented by the inharmonious meeting of the sun and the moon as above recorded. To cut a long story short, it is generally agreed that we are here considering one or other of two eclipses of the sun, which occurred in the years 2136 or 2128 BC respectively, the sun being then in the sidereal division Fang, a locality determined by the stars beta theta pi and rho scorpii and which includes a few small stars in libra and ophiuchus to the north and in lupus to the south how this simple and neat conclusion which i have stated with such apparent dogmatism was arrived at is quite another question and it would hardly be consistent with the purpose of this volume to attempt to work it out in detail but a few points presented in a summary form may be interesting in the first place be it understood that though it is fashionable to cast ridicule on john chinaman especially by way of retaliating for his calling us barbarians yet it is a sure and certain fact that not only have the chinese during many centuries been very attentive students of astronomy but that we westerners owe a good deal of our present knowledge in certain departments to the information stored up by chinese observers during many centuries both before and after the christian era this however is a digression the circumstances of this eclipse, as regards its identification, having been carefully examined by Mr. R. W. Rotham, in 1839, were further reviewed by Professor S. M. Russell in a paper published in the Proceedings of the Peking Oriental Society. The substance of the case is that, in the reign of Chung Kang, the fourth emperor of the Sai dynasty, there occurred an eclipse of the sun, which is interesting not only for its antiquity, but also for the dread fate of the true astronomers royal of the period, who were taken by surprise at its occurrence, and were unprepared to perform the customary rites. These rites were the shooting of arrows, and the beating of drums, gongs, etc., with the object of delivering the sun from the monster which threatened to devour it. The two astronomers, by virtue of their office, should have superintended these rites, 
They were, however, drunk and incapable of performing their duties, so that great turmoil ensued, and it was considered that the land was exposed to the anger of the gods. By way of appeasing the gods, and of suitably punishing the two state officials for their neglect and personal misconduct, they were forthwith put to death, a punishment which may be said to have been somewhat excessive in view of the fact that the eclipse was not a total but only a partial one. An anonymous verse runs, Here lie the bodies of Ho and Hai, whose fate though sad was visible, being hanged because they could not spy the eclipse which was invisible. It appears beyond all reasonable doubt that the eclipse in question occurred on October 22, 2136 B.C. The preliminary difficulties to be got over in arriving at the date arose from the fact that there was uncertainty of 108 years in the date when the Emperor Cheng Kang ascended to the throne, and within these limits of time there were 14 possible years in which an eclipse of the sun in Fang could have occurred. Then the number was further limited by the necessity of finding an eclipse which could have been seen at the place which was the emperor's capital. The sight of this, again, was a matter of some uncertainty. However, step by step, by a judicious process of exhaustion, the year 2136 B.C. was arrived at as the alternative to the previously received date of 2128 B.C. Considering that we are dealing with a matter which happened full 4,000 years ago, it may fairly be said that this discrepancy is not perhaps much to be wondered at, seeing what disputes often happen nowadays as to the precise date of events which may have occurred but a few years or even a few months before the controversy springs up. Professor Russell says that some admirers of the Chinese cite this eclipse as a proof of the early proficiency attained by the Chinese in astronomical calculations. I find no ground for that belief in the text. Indeed, for many centuries later, the Chinese were unable to predict the position of the sun accurately among the stars. They relied wholly on observation to settle their calendar year by year, and seemed to have drawn no conclusions or deductions from their observations. Their calendar was continually falling into confusion. Even at the beginning of this dynasty, when the Jesuits came to China, the Chinese astronomers were unable to calculate accurately the length of the shadow of the sun at the equinoxes and solstices, it seems to me, therefore, very improbable that they could have been able to calculate and predict eclipses. I am not at all sure that this is quite a fair presentation of the case. I do not remember ever to have seen the power to predict eclipses ascribed to the Chinese, but it is a simple matter of fact that we owe to them during many centuries unique records of a vast number of celestial phenomena. Their observations of comets may be singled out as having been of inestimable value to various 19th century computers, especially E. Boyt and J. R. Hind. The second recorded eclipse of the sun would seem to be also due to the Chinese. Confucius relates that during the reign of the Emperor Yu Wang, an eclipse took place. The emperor reigned between 781 B.C. and 771 B.C., and it has been generally thought that the eclipse of 775 B.C. is the one referred to, but Johnson doubts this on the ground that this eclipse was chiefly visible in the circumpolar regions, and if seen at all in China, must have been of very small dimensions. He leans to the eclipse of June 4, 780 B.C., as the only large one which happened within the limits of time stated above. An ancient Chinese historical work, known as the Chan Tzu, written by Confucius, makes mention of a large number of solar eclipses which occurred before the Christian era. This work came under the notice of Monsieur Gobille, one of the French Jesuit missionaries who labored in China some century and a half ago, and he first gave an account of it in his Traite de la Chronologie Chinoise, published in Paris in 1770. The Chan Tzu is said to be the only work really written by Kung Fu Tzu, commonly known as Confucius, the other treatises attributed to him having been compiled by disciples of his either during his lifetime or after his decease. The German chronologist, Idelaer, was acquainted with this work, and in a paper of his own, presented to the Berlin Academy, remarked, What gives great interest to this work is the account of 36 solar eclipses observed in China, the first of which was on February 22, 720 B.C., and the last on July 22, 495 B.C. In 1863, Mr. John Williams, then Assistant Secretary of the Royal Astronomical Society, communicated to the Society in a condensed form the particulars of these eclipses as related in Confucius's book, together with some remarks on the book itself. The Chansu, 
treats of a part of the history of the confederated nations into which china was divided during the chow dynasty that is between 1122 bc and 1255 bc the particular period dealt with is that which extended from 722 bc to 479 bc it was during the latter part of this interval of about 242 years that confucius flourished but the book is not quite a general history for it is more particularly devoted to the small state of lu of which confucius was a native where he passed a great portion of his life and where he was advanced to the highest honors it contains the history of twelve princes of this state with incidental notices of the other confederated nations the number of the years of each reign is accurately determined and the events are classed under the years in which they occurred each year is divided into sections according to the four seasons spring summer autumn winter and the sections are subdivided into months and often the days are distinguished the name chun tzu is said to have been given to this work from its having been commenced in spring and finished in autumn but williams thinks that the name rather refers to the fact that its contents are divided into seasons as stated the style in which it is written is very concise being a bare mention of facts without comment and although on this account it might appear to us dry and uninteresting it is much valued by the chinese as a model of the ancient style of writing it forms one of the wu king or five classical books without a thorough knowledge of which and of the zi shu or four books no man can attain to any post of importance in the chinese empire the account of each eclipse is but little more than a brief mention of its occurrence at a certain time the following is an example of the entries in the fiftieth year of the thirty-second cycle in the fifty-first year of the emperor king wang of the chow dynasty the third year of yin kong prince of lu in the spring of the second moon on the day called kie tzu there was an eclipse of the sun this fifty-eighth year of the thirty-second cycle answers to seven hundred and twenty b c mr williams in the year eighteen sixty three presented to the royal astronomical society a paper setting out the whole of the eclipses of which i have cited but one example converting of course the very complicated chinese dates into european dates these chinese records of eclipses were in eighteen sixty four subjected to examination by the late sir g b airy with results which were highly noteworthy and justify us in reposing much confidence in chinese astronomical work airy remarks the period through which these eclipses extend is included in the time through which calculations of eclipses have been made in the french work entitled l'art de vérifier les dates i have several times had occasion to recalculate with great accuracy eclipses which are noted in that work edition of eighteen twenty and i have found that to the limits of accuracy to which it pretends and which are abundantly sufficient for the present purpose it is perfectly trustworthy i have therefore made a comparison of the chun tzu eclipses with those of l'art de verifier les dates the result is interesting of the thirty-six eclipses thirty-two agree with those at the art de verifier les dates not only in the day but also in the general track of the eclipse as given in the art de verifier which appears to show sufficiently that the eclipse would be visible in that province of china to which the chun tzu was referred airy then proceeds to point out that with regard to the four eclipses which he could not confirm there cannot have been eclipses in april six forty five b c or in june five ninety two b c it appears however from a note by williams that the date attached to the eclipse of six forty five b c is in reality an erroneous repetition in the chinese mode of expressing it of that attached to the next following one and in the absence of a correct date it must be rejected in the record of five ninety two b c june sixteen no clerical error is found but there must be an error of a different class the eclipses of five fifty two b c september nineteen and five forty nine b c july eighteen to which there is nothing corresponding in the art de verifier are in a very different category these occur in the lunations immediately succeeding five fifty two b c august twentieth and five forty nine b c july nineteenth respectively and there is no doubt that those which agree with the art de verifier were real eclipses now there cannot be eclipses visible at the same place in successive lunations because the difference of the moon's longitudes is about twenty nine degrees and the difference of latitudes is therefore nearly three degrees which is greater than the sum of the diameters of the sun and moon increased by any possible change of parallax for the same place 
These, therefore, were not real eclipses. It seems probable that the nominal days were set down by the observer in his memorandum book as days on which eclipses were to be looked for. Airy conjectured that the eclipse of 552 B.C. August 20th and 549 B.C. June 19th were observed by one and the same person, and that he possessed science enough to make him connect the solar eclipses with the change of the moon, but not enough to give him any idea of the limitations to the visibility of an eclipse. On a subsequent occasion, Mr. Williams laid before the Society a further list of solar eclipses observed in China, and extending from 481 B.C. to the Christian era. He collected these from a Chinese historical work entitled Tung King Kang Mu. This work, which runs to 101 volumes, contains a summary of Chinese history from the earliest times to the end of the Yuan Dynasty, A.D. 1368, and was first published about 1473. The copy of Mr. Williams's possession was published in 1808. The text is very briefly worded, and consists merely of an account of the accessions and deaths of the emperors, and of the rulers of the minor states, with some of the more remarkable occurrences in each reign. The appointments and deaths of various eminent personages were also noted, together with special calamities such as earthquakes, inundations, storms, etc. The astronomical allusions include eclipses and comets. Amongst the eclipses are also all, or most of those, which are recorded in the Chen Tzu as having occurred prior to 479 B.C., Though no particular expressions are used to define the exact character of the eclipses, it is to be presumed that some of them must have been total, because it is stated that the stars were visible, albeit that seemingly, in only one instance, is a word attached which specifically expresses the idea of totality. Here again, all the dates were expressed in Chinese style, but, as published by Mr. Williams, were rendered as before in European style by aid of chronological tables, published about 1860 in Japan. Mr. Williams, in his second paper, from which I have been quoting, states that he brought his published account down to the Christian era only as a matter of convenience, but that he had in hand a further selection of eclipses from the Tung King Kang Mu, the interval from the Christian era from the 4th century A.D., yielding nearly 100 additional eclipses. This further transcript has not yet been published, but remains in manuscript in the Library of the Royal Astronomical Society. Mr. Williams died in 1874 at the age of 77, one of the most experienced Chinese scholars of the century. It is remarkable that none of the Chinese annals to which reference has been made included any mention of eclipses of the moon, but the records of comets are exceedingly numerous and, as I have already stated, have proved of the highest value to astronomers who have been called upon to investigate the ancient history of comets. End of chapter 8。Chapter 9 of The Story of Eclipses。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Story of Eclipses by George Chambers. Chapter 9 Are Eclipses Alluded to in the Bible? An interesting question has been suggested. Are there any allusions to eclipses to be found in Holy Scripture? It seems safe to assert that there is at least one, and that there may be three or four. In Amos chapter 8 verse 9 we read, I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. This language is so very explicit and applies so precisely to the circumstances of a solar eclipse that commentators are generally agreed that it can have but one meaning, and accordingly it is considered to refer without doubt to one or other of the following eclipses. 1791 B.C., 1771 B.C., 1770 B.C., or 1763 B.C. Archbishop Usher, the well-known chronologist, suggested the first three more than two centuries ago, whilst the eclipse of 763 B.C. was suggested in recent times and is now generally accepted as the one referred to. The circumstances connected with the discovery and identification of the eclipse of 763 B.C. are very interesting. The date when Amos wrote is set down in the margin of our Bibles as 787 B.C., and if this date is correct, it follows that for his statement to have been a prediction, he must be alluding to some eclipse of later date than 787 B.C., this obvious assumption not only shuts out the eclipse of 1791 B.C., 
but opens the door to the acceptance of the eclipse of 763 B.C. Apparently the first modern writer who looked into the matter after Archbishop Usher was the German commentator Hitzig, who suggested the eclipse of February 9, 1784 B.C. Dr. Pusey was so far taken with this idea that he thought it worthwhile to secure the cooperation of the Rev. R. Main, F.R.A.S., the Radcliffe Observer at Oxford, for the purpose of a full investigation. Mr. Main had the circumstances of that eclipse calculated, with the result that, though the eclipse was indeed total in Africa and Hindustan, yet at Samaria it was only partial and of no considerable magnitude. Dr. Pusey's words summing up the situation are, the eclipse would then hardly have been noticeable at Samaria, certainly very far indeed from being an eclipse of such magnitude, as could in any degree correspond with the expression, I will cause the sun to go down at noon. Beforehand, one should not have expected that an eclipse of the sun, being itself a regular natural phenomenon, and having no connection with the moral government of God, should have been the subject of the prophet's prediction. Still, it had a religious impressiveness then, above what it has now, on account of that wide prevailing idolatry of the sun. It exhibited the object of their false worship, shorn of its light, and passive. Dr. Pusey's commentary, from which the above quotation is made, bears the date 1873, but he appears not to have been acquainted with the important discovery announced no less than six years previously by the distinguished Oriental scholar, Sir H. C. Rawlinson. The discovery to which I allude is a contemporary record on an Assyrian tablet of a solar eclipse, which was seen at Nineveh about twenty-four years after the reputed date of Amos's prophecy. This tablet has been described by Dr. Hinkles in the British Museum Report for 1854, but its chronological importance had not yet then been realized. Sir H. Rawlinson speaks of the tablet as a record of, or register of, the annual archons at Nineveh. He says, in the eighteenth year before the accession of Tiglath Pileser, there is a notice to the following effect. In the month of Sivan, an eclipse of the sun took place, and to mark the great importance of the event, a line is drawn across the tablet, although no interruption takes place in the official order of the eponymies. Here, then, we have notice of a solar eclipse which was visible at Nineveh, which occurred within ninety days of the vernal equinox, taking that as the normal commencement of the year and which we may presume to have been total from the prominence given to the record. And these are conditions which during a century before and after the era of Nabonassar are alone fulfilled by the eclipse which took place on June 15, 763. This record was submitted to Sir G. B. Airy and Mr. J. R. Hind, and the circumstances of the eclipse were computed by the latter, by the aid of Hansen's lunar tables and Le Verrier's solar tables. The result, when plotted on a map, showed that the shadow line just missed the site of Nineveh, but that a very slight and unimportant deviation from the result of the tables would bring the shadow over the city of Nineveh, where the eclipse was observed, and over Samaria, where it was predicted. The identification of this eclipse, both as regards its time and place, has also proved a matter of importance in the revision of scripture chronology, by lowering, to the extent of twenty-five years, the reigns of the kings of the Jewish monarchy. The need for this revision is further confirmed, if we assume that the celebrated incident in the life of King Hezekiah, described as the retrogradation of the sun's shadow on the dial of Ahaz, is to be interpreted as connected with a partial eclipse of the sun. We will now consider this event, and see what can be made out of it. One scripture record, Second Kings chapter 20, verse 11, is as follows, and Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord, and he brought the shadow ten degrees backwards, by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. This passage has greatly exercised commentators of all creeds in different ages of the church, and the most divergent opinions have been expressed as to what happened. This has been due to two causes jointly. Not only is the occurrence incomprehensible, looked at on the surface of the words, but we are entirely ignorant of the construction of the so-called dial of Ahaz, and have little or no material directly available from outside sources to enable us to come to a clear and safe conclusion. No doubt, however, it was a sundial, or gnomon of some kind. Bishop Wordsworth lays stress on the apparent assertion that the miracle was not wrought on any other dial at Jerusalem except that of Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, 
and he treats as confirmation of this statement in second chronicles chapter thirty two verse thirty one that ambassadors came from babylon to jerusalem being curious to learn all about the wonder that had been done in the land i e the land of judah but there is no more taken for granted here than is necessary or as we shall presently see is justifiable to begin with how do we know that there was any other dial at jerusalem like that of ahaz but in point of fact we must make a new departure altogether for it has been suggested i know not exactly by whom or when for the first time that an eclipse of the sun under certain circumstances would explain all that happened and reconcile all that has to be reconciled what happened to hezekiah is thought by many to imply clearly a miracle and it may be said that an eclipse of the sun cannot be held to be a miracle by the ordinary definition of the word but on the other hand it certainly might count as such in the eyes of ignorant spectators who knowing nothing of the theory or practice of eclipses and who would regard such a thing as quite unforeseen unexpected and alarming illustrations of this might be multiplied from all parts of the world in all ages of the world's history let us now see what the argument is as it was worked out by the late mr j w Bosanquet, f r a s shortly before the invasion of judea by sennacherib say in the beginning of the year six eighty nine b c hezekiah was sick unto death in answer to his fervent prayer for recovery the prophet isaiah was sent to him with this message thus saith the lord the god of david thy father i have heard thy prayer i have seen thy tears behold i will add unto thy days fifteen years and i will defend this city and this shall be a sign unto thee from the lord that the lord will do this thing that he has spoken behold i will bring again the shadow of the degrees which is gone down in the sundial of ahaz ten degrees backward so the sun returned ten degrees by which degrees it had gone down isaiah chapter thirty eight verses five to eleven in these words we evidently have mention of some instrument erected in hezekiah's palace in the days of his father ahaz for showing the change in the position of the shadow cast by the sun from day to day this statement is confirmed by a profane writer glycus who states they say that ahaz by some contrivance had erected in his palace certain steps which showed the hours of the day and also measured the course of the sun the idea involved in bringing again through ten degrees backward the shadow of the degrees which had gone down is very noteworthy we seem intended to learn from these words several things for one thing to begin with that the steps as we must consider them to have been on this sundial of ahaz were turned away from the sun for only in that position could they cast their shadow or could the number of the illuminated steps be varied upwards or downwards according to the varying altitude of the sun the only conceivable use of a fixed instrument so placed would be to show the rise and fall of the shadow from day to day as the sun on the meridian gradually rose higher between midwinter and midsummer or descended lower between midsummer and midwinter in passing of course through the winter and summer solstices in turn no simple motion of the sun in its ordinary diurnal progress would produce the effects described on the other hand it is equally clear that the shadow cast by a gnomon properly adjusted at the head of such a series of steps would travel upwards and downwards upon the steps with the sun from winter to summer and from summer to winter indicating at each noon the meridian altitude of the sun from day to day the latitude of jerusalem being thirty one degrees forty seven minutes and the sun's altitude there on the shortest day being thirty four degrees forty one minutes if the gnomon were raised above the topmost step so as to bring the tip of the gnomon or any aperture in it so much above the steps as would be the equivalent of two degrees fifty four minutes or slightly more then the top of the shadow of the gnomon or a spot of light passing through a hole in it would on the shortest day of the year fall just beyond the lowermost step an instrument constructed on the principle just set forth was known to and used by the greek astronomers of antiquity under the name of a Siotheron or shadow taker sometimes and perhaps more properly it was called a heliotropion that is an instrument designed to indicate the turning of the sun at the tropics this be it remembered was information needed by the ancients for the correct regulation of the seasons of the year and of special service to the jews whose greater festivals were fixed in connection with the seasons there is reason to believe that instruments of this character 
were of early invention going back perhaps to the times of homer for we find a passage in the odyssey as follows above ortigia lies an isle of fame far hence remote and syria syros is the name their curious eyes inscribed with wonder trace the sun's diurnal and his summer race pope's rendering of this passage fails however to bring out the salient idea involved butcher and lang translate the passage thus there is a certain isle called Syria, if haply thou hast heard tell of it, over above Ortigia, and there are the turning places of the sun. Mary calls these island names mere inventions of the poet. It seems to me a great question whether Homer's words really support the statement I have made just before quoting it. Diogenes Laertius refers to the same instrument when he speaks of the Heliotropion preserved in the island of Sarah. According to Laertius, Anaximander was the first Greek to use nomens, which he placed on the Syothera of Lacedaemon, for the express purpose of indicating the tropics and the equinoxes. These Syothera were pyramidal in form. An obelisk was the simplest, though an imperfect form of heliotropion, marking indistinctly the length of a shadow at different times of the year, especially the extremes of length and shortness at midwinter and midsummer. It is perhaps interesting to mention that travellers have recorded, in various places, various devices for furnishing information respecting these matters. For instance, in Milan Cathedral, the meridian line is marked on the pavement, and along this line an image of the sun coming through an aperture in the southern wall travels backwards and forwards during the year according to the seasons. Some Jesuit missionaries, who visited China about the middle of the last century, noted a device of this character in operation at the observatory at peking a gnomon had been set up in a low room and one of the missionaries m le comte describes in the following words what they saw in connection with this gnomon the aperture through which the rays of the sun came was about eight feet above the floor it is horizontal and formed of two pieces of copper which may be turned so as to be farther from or closer to each other to enlarge or contract the aperture Lower was a table with a brass plate in the middle, on which was traced a meridian line fifteen feet long, divided by transverse lines which are neither finished nor exact. All round the table there are small channels to receive the water, whereby it is to be leveled. All this may seem rather a digression, and so it is, but I am following Mr. Bonsequet here, in order to better justify the argument that it was an eclipse of the sun which marked the important incident in Hezekiah's life, which has been handed down to us by the sacred writer. It is evident that if a flight of steps were erected on the principles which were set forth above, the steps sloping upwards and southwards, for the northern hemisphere, from the lowest step to within a few inches below an aperture in the gnomon suitably arranged, the ray or image of the sun, whichever it was, would travel day by day up and down such steps between solstice and solstice. We may conclude, therefore, that the instrument which Hezekiah gazed at, and which is in scripture called the dial of Ahaz, was what the Greeks would have termed a heliotropion. The historian's record is to the effect that on the day of Hezekiah's recovery an extraordinary motion of the shadow was observed on the steps of Ahaz, by the rising of the shadow ten steps from the point to which it had gone down with the sun. This effect is spoken of not as a miracle but as a sign. It should also be remembered that the cure of Hezekiah was effected not by a miracle, but by a simple application of a lump of figs. The promise of his recovery was confirmed by the motion of the shadow as already stated. We are justified, therefore, in looking for some ordinary natural phenomenon by which to account for this particular motion of the dial, and something miraculous is not essential. Dean Millman once suggested that the effect might have been produced by a cloud refracting the light. No doubt a dark cloud might produce an apparent interference with the shadow, but it is well pointed out by Bosanquet that in such a case a cloud would have been so manifest to everyone, and the effect so transient, that the phenomenon could hardly have been referred to afterwards as it was in another place as a wonder that was done in the land. Second Chronicles chapter 32 verse 31 it becomes, therefore, alike an obvious and a simple explanation that the shadow caused by the sun might be deflected downwards on such an instrument with a regular and steady motion by the moon passing slowly over the upper part of the sun's disk, as sun and moon both approach the meridian. 
the critical question has now to be raised can astronomers inform us whether a considerable eclipse of the sun occurred at the beginning of the year 689 bc anywhere near noon and which was visible at jerusalem and the answer to this it is interesting to be able to say is a plain and distinctive affirmative there was a large partial eclipse of the sun on january eleventh six eighty nine b c about eleven thirty a m and it was the upper limb which underwent eclipse this eclipse fulfils all the requirements of the case both from the historian's and the astronomer's point of view it occurred about the year fixed by demetrius as that of hezekiah's illness it occurred while the sun was approaching and actually passing the meridian the obscuration was on that part of the sun's disk namely the upper part which would have had the effect of causing the point of light which would seem to emanate from the sun to appear to be depressed downwards and it was visible at jerusalem but there still remains for consideration the final and most important question would a deflection of light proceeding from the sun regarded as a moving body be capable of affecting to the extent of ten steps the shadow on such an instrument as has been described and arising out of this there is the subordinate question would january being the month when this eclipse certainly occurred also be a month suitable for the exhibition of such a phenomena it is ascertainable by calculation that the time occupied by the moon in passing over the sun in the way it did during this eclipse was about two and a half hours but from the time of central conjunction when the obscuration was the greatest and the point of light depressed the most to the time when the uppermost portion of the sun's disk was released by the eastward motion of the moon and the light from the uppermost portion was again manifest was about twenty minutes and this therefore was the time during which the phenomenon of retrogression on the steps would have been exhibited to the king's eyes assuming then that the time when the ascending shadow had travelled upwards to the tenth step coincided or nearly so with the time when the sun had reached its highest altitude for the day at noon we infer that the time of central conjunction during the eclipse was not later than from twenty to fifteen minutes before noon it could not have been much earlier because the phenomenon of the resting of the shadow for a time at its apparently highest point for the day which preceded the promise that it should rise ten steps has also to be accounted for and the cessation of its motion upwards could not have taken place till about twenty-five minutes before noon when the decreasing motion of the sun in altitude or its slackening motion upwards as it approached midday would have become counteracted by the coming on of the eclipse now at eleven thirty five a m the sun's disk would have risen to an altitude of thirty five degrees eight minutes and the highest visible point of light would owing to the eclipse then have been about thirty five degrees four minutes and at eleven forty being the time of greatest obscuration the extreme cusps of light produced by the intervention of the moon would still have stood at about thirty five degrees four minutes just twenty five minutes below the highest point of light at noon figure twelve the whole disk of the sun had now risen above the gnomon yet no motion of the shadow on the steps had been observed for fully five minutes the time shown by the dial was seemingly midday we have now to consider to what extent would a staircase rising at an angle of thirty one degrees forty seven minutes toward the sun with a gnomon so placed at the top as to cast a shadow to the foot of the lower step on the shortest day of the year be affected by a movement in a perpendicular direction of the point of light to the extent of twenty-three minutes or one-third of a degree the effect would be widely different at different times of the year being greatest at midwinter when the shadows are longest and least at midsummer when the shadows are shortest it follows from this that january thirteenth being a day but three weeks removed from midwinter day the normal shadow would not be far from its longest possible length and the effect of a displacement of twenty-three minutes would be neither more nor less than one twelfth of the whole range of the steps whatever that range might have been this extent of motion then is fully sufficient to satisfy the condition prescribed by the biblical narrative of there being such a deflection of the sun's light as would affect the shadow to the extent implied by the words ten steps or ten degrees which is virtually the same idea the same extent of motion could not have been produced under the same conditions either a few days earlier or a few days later that may certainly be taken for granted and the only point in which we are necessarily in doubt 
arises from the fact that we are ignorant of the actual number and nature of the gradations of ahaz's so-called dial if it were permissible to assume that there were one hundred and twenty gradations on the instrument be they steps properly so called on a structure erected in the open air or be they lines on a flat surface on some instrument standing in a room or what not then the problem is solved for one twelfth as above of one hundred and twenty is ten the ten degrees stated in the history as to whether the dial of ahaz was a device built up of masonry in the open air or was an instrument for indoor use we know absolutely nothing and speculation is useless there is something to be said on both sides bosanquet on abstract grounds leans to the latter view on the other hand he calls attention to the present existence in india at delhi and benares of ruined hindu observatories in the form of huge masonry sundials many yards in length and breadth and height finally it may be pointed out that there is some incidental confirmation to be found for this hezekiah incident having happened in winter that the season of the year was winter seems to be suggested by the word used in the original hebrew in connection with the return of the shadow backwards in isaiah chapter thirty eight verse eight might also be translated from the end it would be very natural to hold that this implied that the motion of the shadow was upwards from the lower end of the group of steps towards which the shadow had gone down now the lower end of the steps could only have been the place of the shadow in december or january at or near the time of the winter solstice moreover the mention of the lump of figs seems to suggest the winter season a cake of figs means dried figs not newly gathered summer figs putting all the facts together we may fairly conclude that the astronomical event which happened in connection with hezekiah's illness was an eclipse of the sun and that its date was january eleventh six eighty nine b c a few other scripture passages need a passing mention in isaiah chapter thirteen verse ten we read the sun shall be darkened in his going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine it has been thought by johnson that this passage is an allusion to an eclipse of the sun and so it might be but on the other hand it may be no more than one of those highly figurative phrases which abound in holy scripture and of which the well-known passage the stars in their courses fought against Sisera, judges chapter five verse twenty is a familiar example in jeremiah chapter ten verse two we read be not dismayed at the signs of heaven for the heathen are dismayed at them this is cited as an eclipse allusion by johnson who points out that the utterance of this caution preceded by about fifteen years the celebrated eclipse of thales five eighty five b c but surely this is far-fetched i shall be inclined to attach the same criticism to his next citation ezekiel employs these expressions when shall i put thee out i will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark i will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon shall not give her light chapter thirty two verse seven this language resembles in no small degree isaiah's already quoted and like that might apply to the phenomenon of a solar eclipse but whether that was actually the prophet's intention is another matter he may have witnessed the eclipse of five eighty five b c on the banks of the river chebar and that spectacle may have put this imagery into his head. Further than this, it seems hardly safe to go. This seems an appropriate place to mention a very interesting matter to which attention has been called by Oriental scholars in recent times, who have investigated Assyrian and Egyptian monuments, and other monuments of the same type. The story would be a long and interesting one if presented in detail, and would far exceed my limits of space. I must, therefore, be content with such a summary as that which has been worked out by Mr. E. W. Maunder. Briefly, the facts are these. There are to be found in many places carvings in stone, symbolic of the sun-god once worshipped in the east. The general design, with, of course, variations, is a circle with striated wings extending right and left of two diameters of the wing, more or less, with a lesser extension in a downward direction. Allowing for the roughness of the art, and for the fact that the material was stone, it does not require any very great stretch of imagination to see in these carvings the disk of a totally eclipsed sun with right and left and below it that form of corona which we have come to associate with total eclipses occurring at periods of sun spot minima this idea should not seem far-fetched if we bear in mind the fact that the ancient orientals worshipped the sun moon and planets and one of the natural outcomes of this is submitted for our consideration by maunder in the words following 
there can be little doubt that the sun was regarded partly as a symbol partly as a manifestation of the unseen unapproachable divinity its light and heat its power of calling into active exercise the mysterious forces of germination and ripening the universality of its influence all seemed the fit expressions of the yet greater powers which belonged to the invisible what happened in a total solar eclipse for a short time that which seemed so perfect a divine symbol was completely hidden the light and heat the two great forms of solar energy were withdrawn but something took their place a mysterious light of mysterious form unlike any other light unlike any other single form was seen in its place could they fail to see in this a closer a more intimate revelation a more exalted symbolism of the divine nature and presence just as in the various greek mysteries the student was gradually advanced from one set of symbols to another even more abstruse and esoteric so here on the broad face of heaven itself vouchsafed for a brief space of time and at long intervals apart the deity revealed himself to the initiated by a higher and more difficult symbol than ordinarily the symbol would vary in shape we may take it for granted that the old chaldeans as modern astronomers to-day had at one time or another presented to them every type of coronal structure but there would no doubt be a difficulty in grasping or remembering the irregular details of the corona as seen in most eclipses it occasionally happens however that the corona shows itself under a form of grand and striking simplicity it is now widely recognized that the typical corona of the minimum of the sunspot cycle consists chiefly of two great equatorial streamers maunder then goes on to cite american pictures by truvelot and others of the eclipse of july twenty ninth eighteen seventy eight in which the great extension of the corona to the east and west is specially shown one drawing in particular by miss k e wolcott exhibits the sun with a perfect bright ring around it from which the coronal streamers emanate in the directions mentioned maunder then remarks that he has a strong conviction that it was a corona of this type which was the origin of the ring with wings the symbol which on assyrian monuments is always shown as floating over the head of the ring which is designed to indicate the presence and protection of the deity in the article cited he gives illustrations of two forms under which the ring with wings appears on assyrian and egyptian monuments respectively remarking that egyptians too were astronomers and sun worshippers and were experts in the language of symbols equally with the chaldeans the egyptian priests should have regarded the corona as a symbolical revelation of the deity whose usual manifestation they recognized in the sun and accordingly we find them employing a symbol which is almost as perfect a representation of the corona of minimum as that which the assyrians adopted another curious point commented on by maunder is that the assyrians frequently insert the figure of their deity within the ring and attach thereto a kilt-like dress even when they show the ring without the figure the kilt as it may be called is still there indicating that it is not simply a garment worn by the figure but an integral part of the symbol this kilt is represented as pleated and the resemblance of the pleatings to the polar rays shown on trovelet's drawing of the corona is practically perfect on this point maunder adds if this is a mere chance coincidence it seems to me a most extraordinary one he concludes by saying that these symbols so frequently met with and so clearly designed to indicate the presence of the deity are in their origin drawings of the solar corona as seen at the sun-spot minimum and as such are the earliest eclipse representations which have been preserved to us i give these ideas for what they are worth they are very ingeniously worked out and though the argument is not conclusive yet i do think that there is enough in it to be worth attention end of chapter nine chapter ten of the story of eclipses this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the story of eclipses by george chambers chapter ten eclipses of the sun mentioned in history classical in this chapter we shall for the most part be on a firmer ground than hitherto because several of the most eminent 
Greek and Latin historians have left on record full and circumstantial accounts of eclipses which have come under the notice, and which have been more or less completely verified by the computations and research of astronomers in modern times. But these remarks do not, however, quite apply to the first eclipse which will be mentioned. Plutarch, in his Life of Romulus, refers to some remarkable incident, connected in point of time, at any rate, with his death. The air on that occasion was suddenly convulsed and altered in a wonderful manner, for the light of the sun failed, and they were involved in astonishing darkness, attended on every side with dreadful thunderings and tempestuous winds. This so-called darkness is considered to have been the same as that mentioned by Cicero. There's so much myth about Romulus it is not safe to write in confident language. Nevertheless, it is a fact. According to Johnson, that there was a very large eclipse of the sun visible at Rome in the afternoon of May 26, 715 BC. And 715 BC is supposed to have been the year or about the year of the death of Romulus. Plutarch is also responsible for the statement that a great eclipse of the sun took place some time before the birth of Romulus. And if there's anything in this statement, Johnson thinks that the annular eclipse of November 28, 771 BC might meet the circumstances of the case. But too much romance attached to the history of Romulus for anyone to write with assurance respecting the circumstances of his career. Much of it is generally considered to be fabulous. In the one of the extant fragments of the Greek poet Archilochus, said to be the first who introduced iambics into his verses, the following sentence occurs. Zeus, the father of the Olympic gods, turned the midday into night, hiding the light of the dazzling sun. An overwhelming dread fell upon man. The poet's language may evidently apply to a total eclipse of the sun, and investigations by Posler and Milosevic make it probable that the reference is to the total eclipse of the sun, which happened on April 6, 648 BC. This was total at about 10 a.m. at Thessus and in the northern part of the Aegean Sea. The acceptance of this date displaces by about half a century the date commonly assigned for the poet's career. But this is not thought to be of much account having regard to the hazy character of Grecian chronology before the Persian Wars. On May 28, 585 BC, there occurred an eclipse the surrounding circumstances of which present several features of particular interest. One of the most celebrated of the astronomers of antiquity was Thales of Miletus, and his astronomical labors was said to have included a prediction of this eclipse, which, moreover, has the further interest to us that it has assisted chronologists and historians in fixing the precise date of an important event in ancient history. Herodotus, describing a war, which had been going on for some years between the Lydians and the Medes, gives the following account of the circumstances which led to its premature termination. As the balance had not inclined in favor of either nation, another engagement took place in sixth year of the war, in the course of which, just the battle was growing warm, day was suddenly turned into night. This event had been foretold for the Ionians by Talos of Miletus, who predicted for the very year of which it actually took place. When the Lydians and Midas observed the change, they ceased fighting, and were alike anxious to conclude peace. Peace was accordingly agreed upon, and cemented by a twofold marriage. For, says the historian, without some strong bond, there is a little security to be found in man's covenants. The exact date of this eclipse was long a matter of discussion, 
and eclipses which occurred in 610 BC and 593 BC were each thought at one time or another to have been the one referred to. The question was finally settled by the late Sir G. B. Airy after an exhaustive inquiry in favor of the eclipse of 585 BC. This date has the further advantage of harmonizing certain statements made by Cicero and Pliny. As to its having happened in the fourth year of the 48th Olympiad. Another word or two may be interesting as regards the share which Thales is supposed to have had in predicting this eclipse. The more so that very high authorities in the domains of astronomy and chronology and antiquities take opposite sides in the matter. Sir G. C. Lewis, Bart, and P. may be cited first as one of the unbelievers. He says that Thales is reported to have predicted it to the Ionians. If he had predicted it to the Lydians, in whose country the eclipse was to be total, his conduct would be intelligible, but it seems strange that he should have predicted it to the Ionians who had no direct interest in this event. Belsenquid replies to this by pointing out that Miletus in Ionia was the birthplace of Thales, and also that a shadow covering two degrees of latitude passing through Ionia would also necessarily cover Lydia. Another dissentient is Sir H. C. Rawlinson, who, remembering that Thales is said to have predicted a good olive crop and Anaxagoras the fall of an aerolite. He says, the prediction of this eclipse by Thales may fairly be classed with the prediction of a good olive crop or the fall of an aerolite. Thales, indeed, could only have obtained the requisite knowledge for predicting eclipses from the Chaldeans, and that the signs of these astronomers are those sufficient for the investigation of lunar eclipses did not enable them to calculate solar eclipses. Dependent as such a calculation is not only on the determination of the period of recurrence, but on the true projection also of the track of the sun's shadow along the particular line over the surface of the earth, may be inferred from a finding that in the astronomical canon of Ptolemy, which was compiled from the Chaldean registers, the observation of the moon's eclipse are alone entered. Airy replied to these observations as follows. I think it not at all improbable that the eclipse was so predicted, and there is one easy way, and only one, of predicting it, namely by the Saros, or period of 18 years, 10 days, 8 hours nearly. By use of this period, an evening eclipse may be predicted from a morning eclipse, but a morning eclipse can rarely be predicted from the evening eclipse, as the interval of 8 hours after an evening eclipse will generally throw the eclipse at the end of the Saros into the hours of night. The evening eclipse, therefore, of BC 585, May 28, which I adopt as being most certainly the eclipse of Thales, might be predicted from the morning eclipse of 603 BC, May 17. No other of the eclipses discussed by Bailey and Altman's present the same facility for prediction. Xenophon mentions an eclipse as having led to the capture by the Persians of the Median city Larissa. In the retreat of the Greeks on the eastern side of the Tigris, they crossed the river Zapetas and also a ravine, and then reached the Tigris. According to Xenophon, they found at this place a large deserted city, formerly inhabited by the Medes. Its wall was 25 feet thick and 100 feet high, its circumference 2 parasons, which equals 7.5 miles. It was built of burnt brick on an understructure of stone, 20 feet in height. Xenophon then proceeds to say that when the Persians obtained the empire from the Medes, 
the king of the Persians, besieged the city but was unable by any means to take it, till the cloud having covered the sun and caused it to disappear completely. The inhabitants withdrew in alarm, and thus the city was captured. Close to this city was a pyramid of stone, one plethora in breadth, two plethora in height. Thence the Greeks proceeded six persons to a great deserted castle by a city called Mispilla, formerly inhabited by the Medes. The substructure of its wall was of squared stone abounding in shells. The king of the Persians besieged it, but could not take it. Zeus terrified the inhabitants with thunderbolts, and so the city was taken. The minute description here given by Xenophon enabled Sir A. H. Lyard, Captain Felix Jones and others to identify Larissa with the modern Nimrod and Miss Pilla with Mosul. A suspicion is thrown out in some editions of the Anabasis that the language cited might refer to an eclipse of the sun. It is to be noted, however, that it is not included by Ritualus in the list of eclipses mentioned in ancient writers, which he gives in his Algmestum Novum. Sir G. B. Airy, having had his attention called to the matter, examined roughly all the eclipses which occurred during a period of forty years, covering the supposed date implied by Xenophon. Having selected two, he computed them accurately, but found them inapplicable. He then tried another, May 19, 557 BC, which he had previously passed over because he doubted its totality and he had the great satisfaction of finding that the eclipse, though given a small shadow, had been total, and that it had passed so near to Nimrod that there could be no doubt of its being the eclipse sought. Sir G. B. Airy was such a very careful worker and investigator of eclipses that his conclusions in this matter have met with general acceptance. It must, however, in fairness be stated that a very competent American astronomer, Professor Newcomb, has expressed doubts as to whether, after all, Xenophon's allusion is to an eclipse. But, judging by his closing words, the learned American does not seem quite satisfied with his own skepticism. For he says, Notwithstanding my want of confidence, I conceive the possibility of a real eclipse to be greater than in the eclipse of Thales. While we have the great advantages that the point of occurrence is well defined, the shadow narrow, and if it was an eclipse at all, the circumstances of totality placed beyond serious doubt. In the same year as that in which, according to the common account, the Battle of Salamis was fought, 480 BC. There occurred a phenomenon which is thus adverted to by Herodotus. At the first approach of spring, the army quitted Sardis and marched towards Abydos. At the moment of its departure, the sun suddenly quitted its place in the heavens and disappeared, though there were no clouds in the sight and the day was quite clear. Day was thus turned into night. We are told that, as King was going against Greece and had come into the region of Hellenspot, there happened an eclipse of the sun in the east. This sign portrayed to him his defeat. For the sun was eclipsed in the region of its rising, and Xerxes was also marching from that quarter. So far as words go, this accounts admirably befit a total eclipse of the sun but regarded as such it has given great trouble to chronologers, and the identification of the eclipse is still uncertain. Hain's theory is that the allusion is to an eclipse, and in particular to the eclipse of February 17, 478 BC. Though not total at Sardis, yet the eclipse was very large, 94% of the sun being covered. If we accept this, it follows that the usually recognized date for the Battle of Salamis must be altered by two years. Airy thought that extremely probable that the narrative related to the total eclipse of the moon, which happened on March 13, 479 BC, 
But this is difficult to accept, especially as Plutarch in his Life of Pelopidas says, An army was soon got ready, but as the general was on the point of marching, the sun began to be eclipsed, and the city was covered with darkness in the daytime. This seems explicit enough, assuming the record to be true and that the same incident is referred to by Plutarch as by Herodotus and Aristides. Since the time when Irie and Hind examined this question, all the known facts have been again reviewed by Mr. W. T. Lean, who pronounces, but with some hesitation, in favor of the eclipse of October 2, 480 BC, as the one associated with the Battle of Salamis. He does this by refusing to see in the above quotations from Herodotus any allusion to a solar eclipse at all but invites us to consider a later statement in Herodotus as relating to an eclipse that the historian only calls it a prodigy. After the Battle of Thermopylae, the Peloponnesian Greeks commenced to fortify the Isthmus of Corinth with the view of defending it with their small army against the invading host of Xerxes. The Spartan troops were under the command of Cleombrotus, the brother of Leonidas, the hero of Thermopylae. He had been consulting the oracles in Sparta, and Herodotus states that, while he was offering sacrifice to know if he should march out against the Persian, the sun was suddenly darkened in mid-sky. This occurrence so frightened the Cleombrotus that he drew off his forces and returned home. It is uncertain from the narrative of Herodotus whether Clambrotus returned to Sparta in the autumn of the year of the Battle of Salamis, or in the spring of the next following year, which was the year in which the Battle of Plataea was fought. Bishop Thirwall thinks that it was the latter, but Lean pronounces for the former, adding that the date may well have been in October, and the solar eclipse of October 2, 480 BC may have been the phenomenon which attracted notice, particularly as the sun have been high in the heavens, the greatest phase, six tenths occurring, according to him at fifty minutes past noon. Here I must leave the matter, merely remarking that this alternative explanation obviates the necessity of disturbing the commonly received date of the Battle of Salamis. The city dice states that during the Peloponnesian War, things formally repeated on hearsay, but very rarely confirmed by facts, became not incredible, both about earthquakes and eclipses of the sun, which came to pass more frequently than had been remembered in former times. One such eclipse he assigns to the first year of the war, and says that in the same summer of the beginning of the new lunar month, at which time alone the phenomenon seems possible. The sun was eclipsed after midday, and became full again after it had assumed a crescent form, and after some of the stars had shone out. August 3, 431 BC is generally recognized as the date of this event. The eclipse was not total, only three-fourths of the sun's disk being obscured. Venus was 20 degree and Jupiter 43 degree distant from the Sun, so probably these were the stars that were seen. This eclipse nearly prevented the Athenian expedition against the Lacedaemonians. The sailors were frightened by it, by a happy thought occurred to Pericles, the commander of the Athenian forces. Plutarch, in his Life of Pericles, says, The whole fleet was in readiness, and Pericles on board his own galley, when there happened an eclipse of the sun. The sudden darkness was looked upon as an unfavorable omen, and threw the sailors into the greatest consternation. Pericles, observing that the pilot was much astonished and perplexed, took his cloak, and having covered his eyes with it, asked him if he found anything terrible in that, or considered it as a bad presage. Upon his answering in the negative, he said, Where is the difference then between this and the other, except that something bigger than my cloak causes the eclipse? Another eclipse is mentioned by Thucydides in connection with an expedition of the Athenians 
against Kithera. He says, At the very commencement of the following summer there was an eclipse of the sun at the time of the new moon, and in the early part of the same month an earthquake. This has been identified with the annular eclipse of the March 21, 424 BC, the central line of which passed across northern Europe. It is not quite clear whether the historian wishes to insinuate that the eclipse caused the earthquake or the earthquake the eclipse. An eclipse known as the of Aeneas is another of eclipses antecedent to the Christian era, which has been the subject of full modern investigation, and the circumstances of which are such that, in the language of Professor Hansen, it may be reckoned as one of the most certain and well-established eclipses of antiquity. The record of it has only been brought to light in modern times by the discovery of Cicero's treatise De Republica. Aeneas, the great Roman poet who lived in the 2nd century BC and who died of goat contracted, it is said by frequent intoxication, recorded an interesting event in the following words. Nonis Juni, soli luna obstetit et nox. On the nonis of June, the moon was in opposite to the sun and night. This singular phrase has long been assumed to allude to an eclipse of the sun, but the precise interpretation of the words was not for a long time released. In Cicero's time, the nonis of June fell on the 5th, but in the time of Ennius, who lived a century and a half before Cicero, the nonis of June fell between June 5 and July 4, on account of the lunar years and the intercalary month of the Roman calendar. The date of this eclipse is distinctly known to be June 21, 400 BC, but the hour was long in dispute. Professor Zeck found that the sun set at Rome eclipsed and that the maximum phase took place after sunset. Hansen, however, with his better tables, found that the eclipse was total at Rome and that the totality ended at 7.33 p.m. The sun set in almost immediately afterwards at 7.36. This fact, Hansen considers, explained the otherwise unintelligible passage of Ennius quoted above. Instead of saying et nox, he should have said et simul nox, and immediately it was night. Newcomb questions the totality of this eclipse, but assigns no clear reasons for his doubts. On August 14, 394 BC, there was a large eclipse of the sun visible in the Mediterranean. It occurred in the forenoon and is mentioned by Xenophon in connection with a naval engagement in which the Persians were defeated by Conan. Plutarch, in his Life of Pelopidas, relates how one Alexander of Therui had devastated several cities of Thessaly, and that as soon as the oppressed inhabitants had learned that Pelopidas had come back from an embassy of which he had been to the king of Persia, they sent deputies to him to Thebes to beg the favor of armed assistance with Pelopidas as general. The Thebans willingly granted their request, and an army was soon got ready, but as the general was on the point of marching, the sun began to be eclipsed, and the city was covered with darkness in the daytime. This eclipse is generally identified with that of July 13, 364 BC. If this is correct, Plutarch's language must be incorrect, or at least greatly exaggerated for no more than about three-fourths of the sun was obscured. On February 29, 357 BC, there happened an eclipse also visible in or near the Mediterranean. This is supposed to have been the eclipse for the prediction of which Helicon, a friend of Plato, received from Dionysius, king of Syracuse, payment for the shape of a talent. We have now to consider another ancient eclipse, which has a history of peculiar interest as regards the investigations to which it has been subjected. It is commonly known as the eclipse of Agathicles, and it is recorded by two historians of antiquity in the words following. 
Theodorus Siculus says. Agathocles, also though closely pursued by the enemy, by the advantage of the night coming on beyond all hope, got safe off from them. The next day there was such an eclipse of the sun that the stars appeared everywhere in the firmament, and the day was turned into night. Upon which Agathocles' soldiers, conceiving that the god thereby did foretell their destruction, fell into great perplexities and discontents concerning what was like to befall them. Justin says, By the Herang the hearts of the soldiers were somehow elevated. But an eclipse of the sun that had happened during the voyage still possessed them with superstitious fears of a bad omen. The king was at no less pain to satisfy them about this affair than about the war, and therefore he told them that he should have thought this sign an ill presage for them if it had happened before they set out, but having happened afterwards, he could not but think it presaged ill to those against whom they marched. Besides, eclipses of the luminaries always signify a change of affairs, and therefore some change was certainly signified, either to Carthage, which was in such a flourishing condition, or to them whose affairs were in a very ruinous state. The substance of these statements is that in the year 310 BC, Agathocles, tyrant of Syracuse, while conducting his fleet from Syracuse to the coast of Africa, found himself enveloped in the shadow of an eclipse which evidently, from the accounts, was total. His fleet had been chased by the Carthaginians on leaving Syracuse the preceding day, but got away under the cover of night. On the following morning, about 8 or 9 a.m., a sudden darkness came on, which greatly alarmed the sailors. So considerable was the darkness that numerous stars appeared. It is not at the first easy to localize the position of the fleet, except that the, we may infer that it could hardly be got more than 18 or at the most 100 miles away from the harbor of Syracuse, where it had been closely blockaded by the Carthaginian fleet. Agathocles would not have got away at all, but for the fact that a relieving fleet was expected, and the Carthaginians were obliged to lax their blockade in order to go in search of a relieving fleet. Thus it came about not only that Agathocles set himself free, but was able to retaliate on his enemies by landing on the coast of Africa at a point near the modern Cape Bon and devastating the Carthaginians' territories. The voyage thither occupied six days, and the eclipse occurred on the second day. Thou were not informed of the route followed by Agathocles, that is to say whether he passed round the north or the south side of the island of Sicily, yet it has been made clear by astronomers that the southern side was then taken. Bailey, who was the first modern astronomer to investigate the circumstances of this eclipse, found that there was an inconceivable difference between the path of the shadow found by himself and the historical statement. A gap of about 180 geographical miles seemed to intervene between the most subtly position which could be assigned to the fleet of Agathocles and the most northly possible limit of the path of the eclipse shadow. This was the condition of the problem when Sir G. B. Airy took it in 1853. He, however, was able to throw an entire new light upon the matter. The tables used by Bailey were distinctly inferior to those now in use, and Sir G. B. Airy felt himself justified in saying that to obviate the dissonance of 180 miles just referred to. It is only necessary to suppose an error of 3 degrees in the computer distances of the Sun and Moon at the conjunction, and very inconsiderable correction of the date anterior to the epoch of the tables by more than 21 centuries. It deserves to be mentioned 
though the poem cannot here be dwelt upon at much length, that these ancient eclipses all hang together in such a way that it is not sufficient for the men of astronomy and the men of chronology to agree on one eclipse, unless they can harmonize the facts of several. For instance, the eclipse of Thales, the date of which was long and much disputed, has a material bearing on the eclipse of Agathocles, the date of which admits of no dispute. And one of the problems which had to be solved half a century ago was how best to use the eclipse of Agathocles to determine the date of that of Thales. If 610 BC were accepted for the Thales' eclipse, so as to throw the zone of total darkness anywhere over Asia Minor, where for the sake of history it was essential to put it. The consequence would be that the shadow of the eclipse of 310 BC would have been thrown as far on to land in Africa as to make it out of the question for Agathocles and his fleet to have been in it. Yet we know for certainty that he was in it and in that year and no other year. Conversely, if 603 BC were accepted for the Thales' eclipse, then to rise northwards the position of the shadow in that year from the line of the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf, that it might pass through Asia Minor, would so rise the position of the shadow in 310 BC as to throw it far too much to the north of Sicily for Agathocles, who we know must have gone southwards to Africa to have entered it. But if we assume 585 BC as the date of the eclipse of Thales, we obtain a perfect reconciliation of everything that needs to be reconciled. The shadow of the eclipse of 585 BC will be found to have passed where ancient history tells us it did pass, namely through Ionia and therefore through the center of Asia Minor, and on a direct route from Lydia to Media. Whilst we also find that the shadow of the 310 BC eclipse, that is the one in the time of Agathocles, passed within 100 miles of Syracuse, a fact which is stated almost in those very words by the two historians who have recorded the doings of Agathocles and his fleet in those years. This is where the matter was left by Airy in 1853. Four years later, the new solar and lunar tables of the German astronomer Hansen were published and having been applied to the eclipse of 585 BC. The conclusions just stated were imply confirmed. As if to make assurance doubly sure, Airy went over his ground again, testing his former conclusions with regard to the eclipse of Thales by the eclipse of Larissa in 557 BC, already referred to, and bringing in the eclipse of Stiklastad in 1030 AD to be referred to presently. And as the final result, it may be stated that all the foregoing dates are now known to an absolute certainty, especially confirmed as they were in all essential points by a computer of the eminence of the late Mr. G. R. Hind. On a date which corresponds to February 11, 218 or 217 BC, an eclipse of the Sun which was partially in Italy is mentioned by Livy. Newcomb found that the central line passed a long way from Italy to it far down in Africa. An eclipse of the Sun is mentioned by Dion Cassius is having happened when Caesar crossed the Rubicon, a celebrated event made use of by speakers, political and otherwise, on endless occasions in modern history. There seems no doubt that the passage of the Rubicon took place in 51 BC, and that the eclipse must have been that of March 7, 51 BC. The circumstances of this eclipse have been investigated by Hint, who found that the eclipse was an angular one, the angular phase lasting six and a half minutes in the northern Italy. Arago associates the death of Julius Caesar in 44 BC with the annular eclipse of the sun, but seemingly without sufficient warrant. 
The actual record is to the effect that about the time of the great warrior's death, there was an extraordinary dimness of the sun. Whatever it was, it was noticed. Clearly, it could not have been an annual eclipse, because no such eclipse then happened. Johnson suggests that Rago confused the record of some meteorological interference with the sun's light, with the annual eclipse that happened seven years previously, when Caesar passed the Rubicon, to which eclipse illusion has already been made. That there was for a long while a great deficiency of sunshine in Italy about the time of Caesar's death seems clear from remarks made by Pliny, Plutarch, and Tubulus, and the words of Suetonius seems to imply something of meteorological character. I should not have mentioned this matter at all, but for Agro's high repute as astronomer. According to Seneca, during an eclipse, a comet was also seen. It is an interesting question to incur whether any allusions to eclipse are to be found in Homer, and no very certain answer can be given. In the Iliad, Book 17, lines 366-368, the following passage will be found. No world, you say that the sun was safe, or the moon, for they were wrapped in dark haze in the course of the combat. In the Odyssey, Book 20, lines 356-357, we find, And the sun has utterly perished from heaven, and an evil gloom is overspread. This was considered by all commentators to be an allusion to an eclipse, and in the opinion of W. W. Mary, this is not impossible, as they were celebrating the festival of the new moon. Certainly, this language has somewhat the savor of the total eclipse of the sun, but it is difficult to say whether the illusion is historic, as of a fact that had happened or only evoke generally. Perhaps the latter is the most justifiable surmise. I have, in the many preceding pages, been citing ancient eclipses, for the reason, more or less plainly expressed, that they are of value to astronomers as assisting to define the theory of the Moon's motions in its orbit, and this they should do. But it is not unreasonable to bring this chapter to a close by giving the views of an eminent American astronomer as to the objections to placing too much reliance on the ancient accounts of eclipses, says Professor C. Newcomb. The first difficulty is to be reasonably sure that a total eclipse was really the phenomenon observed. Many of the statements supposed to refer to total eclipses are so vague that they may be referred to other less rare phenomena. It must never be forgotten that we are dealing with an age where accurate observations and descriptions of natural phenomena were unknown and when mankind was subject to be imposed upon by imaginary wonders and prodigies. The circumstance which we should regard as most unequivocally marking a total eclipse is the visibility of the stars during the darkness. But even this can scarcely be regarded as conclusive, because Venus may be seen when there is no eclipse, and may be quite conspicuous in annular or a considerable partial eclipse. The exaggeration of the single object to a plural is in generally very easy. Another difficulty is to be sure of the locality where the eclipse was total. It is commonly assumed that the description necessarily refers to something seen where the writer flourished or where he locates his story. It seems to me that this cannot be safely done unless the statement is made in connection with some battle or military movement, in which case we may presume the phenomena to have been seen by the army. End of chapter 10「Chapter 11 of the Story of Eclipses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Wayne Anderson, Chelsea, Quebec. The Story of Eclipses by George Chambers, Chapter 11. Eclipses of the Sun mentioned in history the Christian era to the Norman Conquest. The Christian era is, for several reasons, a suitable point of time from which to take a new departure in speaking of historical eclipses, although the first century at least might obviously be regarded as belonging to classical history, but let that pass. Dion Cassius relates that on a date corresponding to March 28th, A.D. 5, the sun was partly eclipsed. Johnston says that the central line passed over Norway and Sweden. It seems perhaps a little strange that a writer who lived in Bithynia in the third century of the Christian era should have picked up any information about something that happened in the extreme north of Europe two centuries previously but probably the eclipse must have been seen in Italy. On November 24th, A.D. 29, there happened an eclipse of the sun, which is sometimes spoken of as the eclipse of Phlegon. Eusebius, the ecclesiastical historian, records Phlegon's testimony. Phlegon was a native of Trollus in Lydia and one of the emperor Adrian's freedmen. The eclipse in question happened at noon and the stars were seen. It was total, and the line of totality, according to Hind, passed across the Black Sea from near Odessa to Sinope, thence near the site of Nineveh to the Persian Gulf. A partial eclipse with four-fifths of the sun's diameter covered was visible at Jerusalem. This is the only solar eclipse which was visible in Jerusalem during the period usually fixed for Christ's public ministry. This eclipse was for a long time and by various writers associated with the darkness which prevailed at Jerusalem on the day of our Lord's crucifixion, but there seems no warrant whatever for associating the two events. The crucifixion darkness was assuredly a supernatural phenomena, and there is nothing supernatural in a total eclipse of the sun. To this it may be added that both Tertullian, at the beginning of the 3rd century, and Lucian, the martyr of Nicomedia, who died in 312, appealed to the testimony of national archives then in existence as witnessing to the fact that a supernatural darkness had prevailed at the time of Christ's death. Moreover, the generally recorded date of the crucifixion, namely April 3rd, A.D. 33, would coincide with a full moon. As it happened, that full moon suffered eclipse, but she emerged from the earth's shadow about a quarter of an hour before she rose at Jerusalem. The penumbra continued upon her disk for an hour afterwards. Speaking of the emperor Claudius, Dion Cassius says, There was going to be an eclipse on his birthday. Claudius feared some disturbances, as there had been other prodigies, so he put forth a public notice not only that the obscuration would take place, and about the time and magnitude of it, but also about the causes which produce such events. This is an interesting statement, especially in view of what I have said on a previous page about the indifference of the Romans to astronomy. It would likewise be interesting to know how Claudius acquired his knowledge, and who coached him up in the matter. This eclipse occurred on August 1st, A.D. 45, Barely half the sun's diameter was covered. Philostratus states that about this time, while he was pursuing his studies in Greece, such an omen was observable in the heavens. A crown resembling iris surrounded the disk of the sun and darkened its rays. About this time is to be understood as referring to some date shortly preceding the death of the emperor Domitian, which occurred on September 18th, A.D. 96. This has usually been regarded as the earliest allusion to what we now call the sun's corona, or, as an alternative idea, that the allusion is simply to an annular eclipse of the sun. But both these theories have been called in question by Johnston because he cannot find an eclipse which, in his view of things, will respond as regards date to the statement of Philostratus, and by Lynn on the same ground and on other grounds, more suo. The question of identification requires looking into more fully. There was a total eclipse on May 21st, A.D. 95, 
but it was only visible as a partial eclipse in Western Asia and not visible at all in Greece. This is given as the conclusion arrived at by the German astronomer Ginzel. But it does not seem to me sufficient to overthrow, without further investigation, the fairly plain language of Philostratus, which is possibly confirmed by a passage in Plutarch, in which he discusses certain eclipse phenomena in the light of a recent eclipse. The date of Plutarch's recent eclipse is somewhat uncertain, but that fact does not necessarily mitigate against his testimony respecting the corona or what is regarded to have been such. The statement of Philostratus, treated as a mention of a total solar eclipse, is accepted as sufficiently conclusive by Sir W. Huggins and the late Professor R. Grant. Johnston, to meet the supposed difficulty of finding an eclipse to accord with the assertion of the historian, suggests that perhaps some peculiar solar halo or mock sun or other meteorological formation is referred to, but Stockwell has advanced very good reasons for the opinion that the eclipse of September 3rd, A.D. 118 fully meets the circumstances of the case. Grant's opinion is given in these emphatic words. It appears to me that the words here quoted from Apollonius refer beyond all doubt to a total eclipse of the sun, and thus the phenomena seen encompassing the sun's disk was really, as well as verbally, identical with the modern corona. With the end of the first century of the Christian era, we may be said to quit the realms of classical history and to pass on to eclipse records of a different character, and so far as regards European observations, of comparatively small scientific value or usefulness. Our information is largely derived from ecclesiastical historians and later on from monkish chronicles, which as a rule are meager in a surprising degree. Perhaps I ought not to say surprising, because after the times of the Greek astronomers, who in their way may almost be regarded as professionals, and after the epic of the famous Ptolemy, astronomy well nigh ceased to exist for many centuries in Europe, until, say, the 15th century, barring the labors of the Arabians and their kinsmen the Moors in Spain in the ninth and following centuries. In examining, therefore, the records of eclipses which have been handed down to us from A.D. 100 forwards through more than a thousand years, I shall not offer my readers a long, dry statement of eclipse dates, but only pick out here and there such particular eclipses as seem to present details of interest for some or other reason. On April 12, 237 A.D., there was, according to Julius Capitolinus, an eclipse of the sun so great that people thought it was night and nothing could be done without lights. Ricciolus remarked that this eclipse happened about the time of the sixth persecution of the Christians and when the younger Gordian was proclaimed emperor after his father had declined the proffered dignity, being eighty years of age. The line of totality crossed Italy about 5 p.m. in the afternoon to the north of Rome and embraced Bologna. Calvisius records on the authority of Cedrenus an eclipse of the sun on August 6, 324 A.D., which was sufficiently great for the stars to be seen at midday. The eclipse was associated with an earthquake, which shattered 13 cities in Campania. Johnston remarks that no more than three-fourths of the sun's disk would have been covered as seen in Campania, but that elsewhere in Italy, at about 3 p.m., the eclipse was much larger, and perhaps one or two of the planets might have been visible. On July 17, 334 A.D., there was an eclipse which seems to have been total in Sicily, if we may judge from the description given by Julius Firmicus. Ammianus Marcellinus describes an eclipse to which the date of August 28, 360 A.D. has been assigned. Humboldt, quoting this historian, says that the description is quite that of a solar eclipse, but its stated long duration, daybreak to noon, and the word caligo, fog or mist, are awkward factors. Moreover, the historian associates it with events which happened in the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire, but Johnston seems in effect to challenge Marcellinus's statement when he says, 
It is true that there was an annular eclipse of the Sun in the early morning on the above date, but it could only be seen in countries east of the Persian Gulf. About the time that Alaric, king of the Visigoths, appeared before Rome, there was a gloom so great that the stars appeared in the daytime. This narrative is considered to apply to an eclipse of the sun, which occurred on June 18, 410 A.D. The eclipse was an annular one, but as the central line must have crossed far south of Rome, the stars must have been seen not at Rome, but somewhere else. An eclipse occurred on July 19, 418 A.D., which is remarkable for a twofold reason. People had an opportunity not only of seeing an eclipse, but also a comet. We owe the account of the circumstances to Philostorgius, who tells us that on July 19th, towards the eighth hour of the day, the sun was so eclipsed that even the stars were visible. But at the same time that the sun was thus hid, a light in the form of a cone was seen in the sky. Some ignorant people called it a comet. But in this light we saw nothing that announced a comet, for it was not terminated by a tail. It resembled the flame of a torch, subsisting by itself without any star for its base. Its movement, too, was very different from that of a comet. It was first seen to the east of the equinoxes. After that, having passed through the last star and the bear's tail, it continued slowly its journey towards the west. Having thus traversed the heavens, it at length disappeared, having lasted more than four months. It first appeared about the middle of the summer and remained visible until nearly the end of autumn. Boileau, a French writer, has suggested that this description is that of the zodiacal light, but this seems out of the question in view of the details given by the Chinese of a comet having been visible in the autumn of this year for eleven weeks and having passed through the square of Ursa Major, Reverting to the eclipse, Johnston finds that the greatest phase at Constantinople, which was probably the place of observation, occurred at about half an hour after noon, when a thin crescent of light might have been seen on the northern limb of the sun. From this, it would appear that the central line of eclipse must have passed somewhat to the south of Constantinople. To the same effect, Hind, who found that 95 one-hundredths of the sun's diameter was covered at Constantinople. An eclipse of the sun seems to be referred to by Gregorius Turonensis when he says that then even the sun appeared hideous so that scarcely a third part of it gave light, I believe, on account of such deeds of wickedness and shedding of innocent blood. This would seem to have been the eclipse which occurred on February 24, 453 A.D., when Attila and the Huns were ravaging Italy and to them it was doubtless that the writer alluded. At Rome, three-fourths of the sun's disk would have been eclipsed at sunset, a finding which tallies fairly with the statement of Gregorius. It is not till far into the sixth century that we come upon a native English record of an eclipse of the sun as having been observed in England. This deficiency in our national annals is thus judiciously explained and commented on by our clever and talented American authoress. Speaking of the eclipse of February 15, 538 A.D., she says, The accounts, however, are greatly confused and uncertain, as would perhaps be natural fully sixty years before the advent of St. Augustine, and when Britain was helplessly harassed with its continual struggle in the fierce hands of West Saxons and East Saxons, of Picts and conquering Angles, Men have little time to record celestial happenings clearly, much less to indulge in scientific comment and theorizing upon natural phenomena, when the history of a nation sways to and fro with the tide of battle, and what is gained today may be fatally lost tomorrow. And so there is little said about this eclipse, and that little is more vague and uncertain even than the monotonous plaints of Gildas, the one writer whom Britain has left us, in his meagre accounts of the conquest of Kent and the forsaken walls and violated shrines of this early epoch. The well-known Anglo-Saxon chronicle is our authority for this eclipse having been noted in England, but the record is bare indeed. 
In this year, the sun was eclipsed 14 days before the calends of March, from early morning till 9 a.m. Tichel Brahe, borrowing from Calvisius, who borrowed from somebody else, says that the eclipse happened in the fifth year of Henry, king of the West Saxons, at the first hour of the day till nearly the third, or immediately after sunrise. Johnson finds that at London nearly three-fourths of the sun's disk was covered at 7.43 a.m. The next eclipse recorded in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is somewhat difficult to explain. It is said that in 540 a.d. the sun was eclipsed on the 12th of the calends of July, equaling June 20th, and the stars appeared full nigh half an hour after 9 a.m. Johnson's calculations make the middle of the eclipse to have occurred at about 7.37 a.m. at London, two-thirds of the sun's diameter being covered. He notes that the moon's semi-diameter was nearly at its maximum, whilst the sun's semi-diameter was nearly at its minimum, a favorable combination for a long totality. The visibility of the stars seems difficult to explain in connection with this eclipse, and therefore he suggests that the analyst has made a mistake of four years and meant to refer to the eclipse of September the 1st, 536 A.D., but this does not seem a satisfactory theory. The year after Pope Martin held a synod to condemn the monotheist heresy, an eclipse of the sun took place. It is mentioned by Tycho Brahe in his Catalogue of Eclipses as having been seen in England. Johnson gives the date as February the 6th, 650 A.D., and finds that the sun was three-fourths obscured at London at 3.30 p.m. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle tells us, under the year A.D. 664, that in this year the sun was eclipsed on the 5th of the Nones of May, and Ersenbright, king of the Kentish people, died, and Ekbright, his son, succeeded to the kingdom. Kepler thought this eclipse had been total in England, and Johnson, calculating for London, found that on May 1st at 5 p.m. there would only have been a very thin crescent of the sun left uncovered, on the southern limb, so that the line of totality would have passed across the country some distance to the north of London. The eclipse of December the 7th, A.D. 671, seems to be associated with a comic tragedy. The Caliph Moawiyah had a fancy to remove Mohammed's pulpit from Medina to his own residence at Damascus. He said that the walking stick and pulpit of the Apostle of God should not remain in the hands of the murderers of Othman. Great search was made for the walking stick, and at last they found it. Then they went in obedience to his commands to remove the pulpit, when immediately, to their great surprise and astonishment, the sun was eclipsed to that degree that the stars appeared. Once again, the question of visible stars is in some sense a source of difficulty. Hind found that the eclipse was annular on the central line. At Medina, the greatest phase occurred at 10 hours 43 minutes a.m., when 85 one-hundredths of the sun's diameter was obscured. Hind suggests that in the clear skies of that part of the world, such a degree of eclipse might be sufficient to bring out the brighter planets or stars. At any rate, no larger eclipse visible at Medina occurred about this epoch. Professor Ockley seems to refer to this eclipse in making, on the authority of several Arabian writers, the mention he does of an eclipse in the quotation just given. Perhaps this will be a convenient place to bring in some remarks on certain Arabian observations of eclipses only made known to the scientific world in modern times. That the Arabians were very capable practical astronomers has long been recognized as a well-established fact, and if it had not been for them, there would have been a tremendous blank in the history of astronomy during at least six centuries from about the year A.D. 700 onwards. In the year 1804, there was published at Paris a French translation of an Arabian manuscript preserved at the University of Leiden, of which little was known until near the end of the last century. The manuscript was then sent to Paris on loan to the French government, which caused a translation to be made by Citizen Cousin and this was published under the title Le Livre de la Grande Table Hakanate. Cousin was professor of Arabic at the College of France. 
Newcomb considers this to contain the earliest exact astronomical observations of eclipses which have reached us. He remarks that some of the data left us by Ptolemy, Theon, Albategnius, and others may be the results of actual observations, but in no case, so far as is known, have the figures of the actual observations been handed down. For example, we cannot regard midnight nor the middle of an eclipse as moments capable of direct observation without instruments of precision. But in the Arabian work under consideration, we find definite statements of the altitudes of the heavenly bodies at the moments of the beginning and ending of eclipses, data not likely to be tampered with in order to agree with the results of calculation. The eclipses recorded are 28 in number, and usually the beginning and end of them were observed. The altitudes were given sometimes only in whole degrees, sometimes in coarse fractions of a degree. The most serious source of error to be confronted in turning these observations to account arises from the uncertainty as to how long after the first contact the eclipse was perceived and the altitude taken, and how long before the true end was the eclipse lost sight of. Making the best use he could of the records available, Newcomb found that they could safely be employed in his investigations into the theory of the moon. The observations were taken, some at Baghdad and the remainder at Cairo. I do not propose to occupy space by transcribing the accounts in detail, but one extract may be offered as a sample of the rest. Eclipse of the Sun observed at Baghdad, August 18, 928 A.D., the sun rose about one-fourth eclipsed. We looked at the sun on a surface of water and saw it distinctly. At the end, when we found no part of the sun was any longer eclipsed, and that its disk appeared in the water as a complete circle, its altitude was 12 degrees in the east, less than one-third of a division of the instrument, which itself was divided to thirds of a degree. One must therefore reduce the stated altitude by one-ninth of a degree, leaving, therefore, the true altitude at 11 degrees, 53 minutes, 20 seconds. The skill and care shown in this record shows that the Arab who observed this eclipse nearly a thousand years ago must have been a man of a different type from an ordinary resident of Baghdad in the year 1899. No description is given of the instrument used, but presumably it was some kind of a quadrant. It does not appear why some of the observations were made at Baghdad and some at Cairo. The Baghdad observations commence with an eclipse of the sun on November 30th, 829, and end with an eclipse of the moon on November 5th, 933. The Cairo observations begin with an eclipse of the sun on December 12, 977, and end with an eclipse of the sun on January 24th, 1004. These statements apply to the 25 observations which Newcomb considered were trustworthy enough to be employed in his researches, but he rejected three as imperfect. I have broken away from the strict thread of chronological sequence in order to keep together the notes respecting Arabian observations of eclipses. Let us now revert to the European eclipses. Under the date of A.D. 733, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle tells us in this year Ethelbald captured Somerton, and the sun was eclipsed, and all the sun's disk was like a black shield, and Acca was driven from his bishopric. Johnston suggests that the reference is to an annular eclipse, which he finds occurred on August the 14th at about eight and one quarter hours in the morning. In Schnurrer's Chronik der Seuchen, it is stated that one year after the Arabs had been driven back across the Pyrenees, after the Battle of Tours, the sun was so much darkened on the 19th of August as to excite universal terror. It may be that the English eclipse is here referred to, and a date wrong by five days assigned to it by Schnurrer. Humboldt reports this eclipse in an enumeration he gives of instances of the sun having been darkened. On May 5th, A.D. 840, there happened an eclipse of the sun which amongst other effects, is said to have so greatly frightened Louis Le Debonair, Charlemagne's son, that it contributed to his death. The emperor was taken ill at Worms, and having been removed to Ingelheim, an island in the Rhine near Mayence, died there on June 20th, 
hind found that this was a total eclipse and that the northern limit of totality passed about 100 miles south of Worms. The middle of the eclipse occurred at 1.15 p.m., with the sun at an altitude of 57 degrees. The duration of the eclipse was unusually long, namely about five and a half minutes. With the sun so high and the obscuration lasting so long, the eclipse must have been an unusually imposing one and well calculated to inspire special alarm. On October 29th, 878, in the reign of King Alfred, there was a total eclipse visible at London. The mention of it in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is as follows. The sun was eclipsed at one hour of the day. No month is given, and the year is said to have been 879, which is undoubtedly wrong. Hind found that the central line of the eclipse passed about 20 miles north of London, and that the totality lasted 1 minute and 51 seconds. Tisho Brahe, in his Historia Colestis, quotes from the Annals Fuldenses a statement that the sun was so much darkened after the ninth hour that the stars appeared in the heavens. Thorpe, in his edition of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, quotes from Mr. Richard Price, a note which assigns the date of March 14, 880, to this eclipse, and cites in confirmation a passage from the Chronicle of Florence of Worcester, Anno 879. The 880 eclipse is mentioned by Asser in his De Vita et Rubus Gestus Alfredi, in the words following. In the same year, 879, an eclipse of the sun took place between three o'clock and the evening, but nearer three o'clock. The confusion of dates is remarkable. In the Chronicon Scotorum, under the date 885, we find an eclipse of the sun and stars were seen in the heavens. The reference appears to be to the total eclipse of June 16, A.D. 885. The totality lasted more than four minutes, and as the stars are said to have been visible in the north of Ireland, doubtless that part of Ireland came within the eclipse limits. On December 22, 968, there was an eclipse of the sun, which was almost total at London, at about 8.33 a.m., or soon after sunrise. A central line passed across the southwest of England, and thence through France to the Mediterranean. One Leon, a deacon at Corfu, observed this eclipse, and has left behind what probably is the first perfectly explicit mention of the corona. On August 30th, 1030, there happened an eclipse visible in Norway, which has already been alluded to on a previous page under the name of the Eclipse of Sticklastad. This was one of those eclipses, the circumstances of which were examined many years ago in detail by Sir G. B. Airy, because he thought that information of value might be obtained therefrom with respect to the motions of the moon. Its availability for that purpose has, however, been seriously questioned by Professor Newcomb. Sticklestad is the place where a battle was fought at which Olav, king of Norway, is said to have been killed. While the battle was in progress, the sun was totally eclipsed and a red light appeared around it. This is regarded as an early record of the corona, though not the first. Johnston found that the eclipse was nearly total at about 2 hours and 21 minutes p.m. In 1033, there happened on June 29th an eclipse of the sun, which evidently had many observers, because it is mentioned by many contemporary writers. For instance, the French historian Glaber says that on the 3rd of the Calends of July, there was an eclipse from the 6th to the 8th hour of the day, exceedingly terrible, for the sun became of a sapphire color, in its upper part having the likeness of a fourth part of the moon, this sufficiently harmonizes with Johnston's calculations that about four-fifths of the sun on the lower side was covered at ten hours fifty minutes in the morning. End of chapter 11. Read by Wayne Anderson, Chelsea, Quebec.